Hey everybody, welcome to the Gym Master Show. It's so great to have you guys here. Hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us. We love to have you with us as often as you can be. And we always have a good time with all of you as well. Coming to you from the East Coast of the United States. We say hello to our, our Lovety family, the JMS Lovety family. That's the folks who watch our series all the time. They just love what we do. They love the vibe of our series. It's an entertainment lifestyle, variety, celebrity talk show series, hundreds of episodes, and always a good, good time. Uh, wherever you're watching around the world, we know that uh, in the United States, especially in the South, there's a lot of rough weather. So we send our uh, Jameis Lovety to those who are in the South right now. Crazy weather happening all around the world. But uh, we're thinking about all of you there. And uh, thanks for all the great, uh, you know, fantastic vim and vigor that you have for this show. It's so cool to hear from all of you writing to us privately in emails and uh, on messenger for facebook instagram twitter sharing all the links to our series the gym masters show live series uh, where our guests come from all different backgrounds celebrity friends and so much more and they always have uh, some cool conversations with us poignant moments levity and uh, lots of interactivity too matter of fact this is a very interactive show we don't really call it interviews we call it conversations that's something a little bit more I think interactive and deeper when you have conversations versus just question, answer, question, answer, which a lot of people do. We throw that uh, sort of uh, format and mold out the window and we make it conversations like Johnny Carson, Dick Cavett, Steve Allen, Regis Philbin, Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, you know, the legends, legendary TV presenters and hosts in America and uh, with a modern vibe, modern twist of today. With all that said, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Hope your day is going well. Extremely busy for me. I was on the air all day today doing my thing on radio, hosting multiple shows. And we had one TV shoot and I was writing a lot of scripts today. And then we were preparing all the episodes coming up this week for the Gym Masters Show series for all of you and you and you. We've got an extraordinary guest who's joining us from Florence, Alabama. That's right. Beautiful state of Alabama. It's going to be joining us in just a second. We're here in the New York area along the southern New England coast between New York and Boston. That's where your show, the Gym Master Show, and I say your show because it's our show. You, me, and us, and all of us together uh, originates from, and we always have a wonderful time hearing from everybody. Gang, if you'd like to comment during the show, you can do that. Uh, we say hello to the JMS Lovety family. That's everybody watching. If this is your first time watching the Gym Master's Show series, we welcome you. Thanks for being with us. Don't keep it a secret. Let everybody know we're here. Share the links on your social media. Always join us. Have a good time. You always learn something. Be entertained, informed, and uh, hopefully your lives are enriched by the conversations that we have and all the cool surprises that we have up our sleeves as well. We take ourselves seriously, and sometimes we don't take ourselves seriously at all. That's the way life really should be. We do have somebody who takes his craft very seriously, one of America's finest painters, renowned and celebrated artist extraordinaire, Tim Stevenson, joining us from Florence, Alabama, Northern Alabama. He is incredible. We are going to be showing you uh, some really beautiful exclusive works of his here on our show, and we are so excited and honored to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, he's joining us here on the show in just a second. You know, he had a solo exhibition of over 60 of his most recent works featuring the peaceful vistas of the Tennessee Valley, vivid still life and thoughtful figurative paintings in watercolor and oil at the Carnegie Visual Arts Center in Decatur, Alabama and in Tecumbia, Alabama and at the Tennessee Valley Arts Museum, a native born Alabama artist. He has been painting for some 50 years in the tradition of the old masters. Yes. Ramir and Rembrandt we're talking about. Self-taught artist who drew pictures for cookies. Uh, yeah, he drew pictures for cookies. I love that. At age three, draw the picture, get the cookie. Why didn't I think of that? I love cookies and I've, I've been drawing for years. How come I didn't put the two worlds together? <laughs> See, he's entrepreneurial as well. Uh, his intermittent excursions into art included cartooning, advertising, illustration, and billboard painting along the way. And for years, Tim uh, taught painting and drawing at his namesake art studio in school, teaches small groups of students twice a month, and he finishes a new painting roughly every two weeks. And his work is extraordinary, and it is revered, and it's renowned. Uh, 
look at this shot here. Don't you love this? <laughs> this is just one thing we want to show you just to give you a little idea of what we're talking about. He is really something else. Uh, again, he's a beloved. He's revered. He truly is one of America's most celebrated and finest landscape painters and lots more. And we are very, very honored to have him here on the show. So if you'd like to comment during the show, everybody, while is, uh, Tim is with us, while the show is here, the show is on for you, do take a moment and uh, you know leave a comment, of course, on our YouTube channel. Give this episode a like. And at the same time, uh, make sure if you want to be a part of the JMS uh, Lovity squad chat room that we have. <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah, that chat room is open and available for all of you. And if you'd like to uh, comment while the show is on, you can certainly do that right now when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is the channel you're watching right now, Jim Masters TV. Just click the red subscribe button. Sometimes the subscribe button, the subscribe button sometimes is black instead of red, whatever your format is. Just click the subscribe button. It's not easy to say, click the subscribe button fast. You end up saying subscribe button. You know what it is. <laughs> Whether you say subscribe or subscribe, whatever it is, click it. You'll be glad you did. And make sure you click, there's no cost for it either. And click that notification bell, little bell icon right next to it. So you get alerts from us about all these great episodes, all these cool guests, and all of these incredible conversations we have here on the Jim Master Show series. So without further ado, join me in welcoming, again, celebrated artist, incomparable Tim Stevenson joining us here from his studio. Tim, welcome to the Jim Master Show. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, great to be here, uh, be here with you. You know, I was thinking when you said Johnny Carson and Cavett, that today we've updated things. We're not in the studio. I'm in my studio. You're in yours. And uh, via internet, we get to talk. So that's great. Isn't this amazing? From miles apart, same country, but miles apart, northeast and south coming together, linked through uh, technology. Our viewers watching right now and commenting are sort of like our virtual studio audience. They're here, maybe not in front of us. We don't hear the clapping and the cheers, but... Uh, they give their clapping and their cheers through comments and likes and subscribing and all the rest. How are you uh, today? Was it a busy day for you? I mean, I mentioned you're always you're always at the easel. You're always painting. <laughs> I did. I painted today for about seven hours, and then uh, I got to walk in. It was kind of a gloomy day here. It was good to get out, and uh, I go down by the river quite a bit. So that's where I went today and walked by the river. Watch the fishermen catching a few fish, and, and uh, even with the clouds, it's always great. That sounds really, really nice. I mean, that sounds that sounds like a fantastic way to be inspired. It is so obvious for you that nature inspires you exquisitely and extraordinarily. I know it does for me when I'm in a forest. I'm a gardener. I've got a green thumb. I'm always working out in the yard. The ocean for me, because we are here on the East Coast, swimming, surfing, boogie boarding, sailing, whatever. And the audience I've mentioned here multiple times to them, but the ocean for me is a very strong thing that I'm connected to, the energy, the beauty of the ocean, the power of the ocean. Nature for you is a very, very important in your life, and it's reflected so beautifully in your work, Tim. Well, thank you so much. And you know, the thing is, Jim, when I go out and get fed, then it feeds into the art. So there's a lot of um, contemplation, you know, uh, being outside, and and there I have favorite places I go to. I actually live on a creek, which is right behind the house where I am right now. So, and it's beautiful. I get to see the sunrise over the creek. And yeah. The river is only about two and a half, three miles from me. And I get uh. to go on a daily basis almost. Wow. So it keeps coming in and then I get to give it back out. Isn't that fantastic? Now, I mentioned, and this is so cool. I don't know how I didn't think of this because I love to draw and I've been drawing, you know, for many, many years. Always had the sketch pads, always loved the art classes and did, did even some of those home instruction classes and all when I was a kid. 
but I never thought about drawing for cookies. How did you come up with that ingenious idea? <laughs> I guess that's pretty smart for three. I don't know. <laughs> well, the story is that my dad's first cousin's wife, who lived right up the street, was an excellent cook. She was also an artist herself. She wrote songs. I think I remember she wrote over 500 songs. Wow. She was an avid reader, always had a lot of books. And she lured me to her house to draw, to teach me to draw when I was three years old. And she would say, draw this bird and I'll give you this cookie. Well, you know, I'm still doing it for cookies, but just a different. Now, what kind of cookies were you drawing for? Or was it a variety of different kinds of cookies? We do have a foodie audience here. <laughs> well, you know, my favorite is oatmeal cookies. I mean, mm. just basic oatmeal cookies. But yeah. uh, I don't know. It's been 70 years, but I'm, I'm thinking they were oatmeal cookies. So, we'll yeah. stick. so I tell you, the inspiration, the cookies started it for you, uh, but other things did as well. W were you always doodling as a child? I mean, when did you realize, but also when did the family and, and teachers and others around you, the adults around you, realize that you had this interest, this this passion or did it develop itself later? Were there other things you were doing in between? Tell us about some of the inspirational journey for you, Tim. Well, I do remember an episode in the second grade when uh, I got caught drawing when I should have been listening. And the teacher called me up to the front of the room and she said, before you come, reach into your desk and bring all that stuff in there. Well, I had been doing drawings and sticking them into the desk underneath. And I thought I was going to get the guillotine. You know, it was like, what is she, you know, death sentence for getting This caught. is that. So I go up and I bring my drawings and she looks over them very carefully. Miss Henderson, by the way, just thought mm -hmm. of her name. You remember the oatmeal cookies and Miss Henderson, the things we remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is second grade and she looks at the drawings and she said, these are pretty good. Well, it was just like rocket fuel to me, you know, because I already had the inclination. And I did, I doodled and, and just kind of went with that through childhood. But then there was fishing, baseball, you know, all that other stuff. And my family were gardeners. And so we always mm -hmm. had vegetable gardens. So we, you know, summertime was working in the gardens. But all the time, I think I was just making notes, making mental notes mm -hmm. about what would come later. I didn't know, I don't think I, I really knew until I was about 18 that this was going to be my career. Yeah. And uh, sort of a funny story in a way, when I was entering college and I sat down with a counselor and the fellow said, what is your major? And I said, I don't know. Well, I kind of had it in the back of my mind. And I think he had seen too many undecided kids that day. And he mm. kind of got mad at me. And he said, well, what do you like to do? And I said, I like to draw. He said, you're an art major. So that was kind of inauspicious. But mm. uh, I got into some art classes, loved them, enjoyed the camaraderie with the other students. And I think it just really took hold. And about within a year or so, I knew this was it. You know, this were there was other artistic endeavors that you were pursuing or that you were doing uh, concurrent to the drawing as well and painting? Well, you know, a little bit of uh, watercolor and pastel. The watercolor came later really as, as a, it's really my forte. That's what I do best. Mm. I, I really got, earnest about watercolor around 1978. And I tell my students, it took me 20 years to master it. So, uh, you know, it, it's a difficult medium in, in some ways, and particularly the way I paint. I didn't know other artists who were painting like that, but I had seen some English watercolors from the Victorian era. And I knew it was possible to interface with nature, and this is what I was doing at the time, in watercolor in a way that was as specific as oil painting. Mm -hmm. So I began to pursue the methodology. Now, the Victorian painters 
we're using what's equivalent to gouache, which is opaque watercolor. And I wanted to do transparent watercolor. So I had to work out my own method. I couldn't find a teacher really, Jim. So uh, I had to work out my method for figuring out how to do that. What were some of the reasons that made it so difficult? Like you said, working with that sort of style of watercolor is, is difficult. What is it about it that makes it difficult, that makes it a challenge? Well, with the oil painting, you can wipe out or paint over. If you're painting in transparent watercolor, you pretty much have to have a game plan from the beginning. Mm. And what that means is to do a very specific drawing. So I do spend a lot of time in the conception of paintings and, and, and I, I don't cheat on drawing. I, I really know where I'm going before I ever start, hmm. before I pick up the brush. And so it becomes a chess match at that point. What, what do you put first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? Some of the watercolors, if at some point during our conversation, we'll show some still life paintings. Um, I say chess match because I want to make sure that I do the first things first and the second second and the third third and so forth. The other thing about the difficulty aspect of it is that uh, it's unforgiving. Mm. You know, could have 50 or 100 hours in a painting and screw it up. You know, it's very easy to do that. The mind wanders and next thing you know, okay, that's done. Right, exactly. Yeah. How do you keep the focus? Well, uh, <laughs> good question. I think it's it's about the dedication aspect of it and the desire to get to that finished state. Mm. I love the last couple of days on a painting. And if I've made all the right decisions along the way, then the last two days are, are really kind of fun to know that you're almost there and that the completion is near. Yeah. Now, some of those paintings, Jim, will have 30 layers of paint. So it's, uh, you know, it's a very deliberate method of painting. Um, there, you know, you can see paint, you see watercolor paintings that are done in one sitting and they look fresh and all that. I love that too. And I do field studies like that, like for oil paintings, sometimes I do small watercolors. But the paintings that I dedicate a lot of time to are, are very deliberate in their, in their production. Hmm. It really is. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you maintain the, the steady hand, the patience that are, is required as well? Well, steady hand, uh, I'm 74 years old. That's getting to be more of an issue. Uh, I have to go through a routine in the morning, like uh, I have an old friend who would play Bach in the morning to loosen his fingers up. Well, I go through a little routine with painting, like I just take a piece of paper and kind of scribble on it a little bit to get my hand to make sure I have what I need. Uh, I generally start painting about 8 o'clock in the morning and up until 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So once I get uh, the feeling for my hand and feel like I have enough uh, security in my in, in confidence that I can can deliver the strokes that I need to, then I proceed into the painting. The patience is another thing. I mean, I get that question a lot. You know, um, I think the fact that I love what I do so much. Patience comes naturally because I genuinely I love watching that painting emerge out of that beautiful sheet of paper. Mm. I like to use uh, Fabriano paper, which is made in Fabriano, Italy, and they make a beautiful paper. And, um, and, and the beauty of watercolor in that sense is the transparency of the pigment sitting on top of that beautiful piece of cotton paper. Mm -hmm. That's where it gets the luminosity. Well, which kind of brings another subject, if you don't mind me kind of continuing on that. Sure, story. absolutely. It's fascinating for everybody, yeah. 
I, I fell in love with the Dutch masters about 30 years ago. And uh, there was an episode where my wife and I were in the Rijksmuseum and we separated and decided we would meet uh, back at the entrance in a couple of hours. I wandered into a room of so-called minor master still out painters. And it literally made me weak in the knees. I mean, the painters were so good. And I'd never heard of them. You know, we heard of Rembrandt, Vermeer, and so forth. But, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I was unfamiliar with these painters. And I, and I got weak in the knees, as I say. I literally had a physiological reaction to those paintings. And so I sat down, there was a bench in the middle of the room. And my second thought was, uh, after being astonished, everything I've done up to this point is crap. <laughs> you know, uh, these painters really set a standard that, uh, that made me feel like I had a long way to go. So I began to think about coming back and back to Georgia where I lived at the time. My wife and I lived in Georgia and began to try to master a technique that would be in watercolor what those painters were doing in oil 350 years prior. So I began to work at that and I've been painting in watercolor since 78. So this is around 1990, it's 12, 13 years into it. And I began to tighten up my technique, you know, and try to figure out how to layer color, which is really the thing that I've wanted to do along. And so I started painting still lives. Um, at the time, we had a, an oriental rug store. We were selling oriental rugs. And so it was pretty much a natural for me to start composing paintings with rugs. And I began to do a series. It took 10 years to do 80 paintings. Um, mm. So, you know, it was very slow. I'm much faster now because I've learned a lot of, uh, I've learned a lot from my mistakes, let's say. And I've learned a lot of how to speed the process up. Um, so I do paintings now. I can do the same thing. It used to take a month. I can do in, say, two weeks. That's incredible. Wow. That's amazing. Are you uh, often commissioned as well? It is fun to do commissions because uh, with still life paintings, I can take people's prized possessions. Uh, I did one recently, just a couple of years ago here for a couple, and they just assembled a bunch of things. I went to their house. I took one of their rugs and then put all the objects together and, uh, made some photographs. I work from photographs quite a bit. Yeah. What, what I do is I, I photograph everything in natural light. And then I generally will bring all the objects back into the studio and set up the still life again so I can paint from life. Mm. But the photo will give me a very specific light. And, uh, and that's important in order to make a painting convincing. Absolutely. Got a yeah. couple of shots here. Like, like if, I mean, this is fantastic. That's, uh, that's my old studio, which was downtown. And that is my wife painting. She was over in the corner doing a little painting. And, um, and it just struck me that that would be a great, uh, a great thing to remember. Now, how long would it take to have done something like this, Tim? That's actually an oil painting. Um, yeah, the detail is extraordinary. It's uh, 30 by 40 inches. And uh, I think it probably took about three to between three and four weeks. You know, when I look at work like this sometimes, and I don't know if this is something that seems out of the ordinary or makes sense, but when I see this kind of work, especially in oils, uh, to me, it gives it almost a film esque quality, like it's like it's a film, almost as if it's part of a an actual film. And I think in this particular form, this is what can bring it to that sort of state. Do you know what I mean? It has sort of this just this 
richness, this depth, this warmth, this almost uh, of a silky quality, but something about it that whenever I see this kind of presentation, I it always, and I'm thinking of it as, you know, a television person, radio person, film person, it always gives me sort of a, the equivalent of like a film S quality, a high grade, higher end, uh, almost like a frozen frame from a film. Well, and, and if you take uh, a particular scene like this, it could be in in the beginning, the middle, or, or toward the end of a narrative. You know? Yes. Uh, it, it has that feeling about it. Doesn't think, it? Uh, the one thing that I go back to when I'm doing interior paintings is the precedent that was set by Vermeer in that there is a great deal of stillness in the painting. Yeah, that's a more recent painting. That is a watercolor right there. That's the watercolor. Yeah. So what was happening here, this is a little bit prosaic, I guess, in a way, but the reflection of sun was uh, on the wall. And this is a mural in the dining room, by the way, that uh, there's a bookshelf just below where this is. Yeah. But, but that, that, uh, that bright spot in there, the sun was... It just happened that the angle of the sun was reflecting off the front of my vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> and I walked through the room and I said, oh, my God, look at that. Yes. And so I knew that where that vehicle was parked and the particular time of day that I could come back the next day and set it up. Mm. So I did. And I came yeah. back carefully over the next 24 hours set up still life. And then when the sun got in that position, uh, I took pictures of that. And then again, as I said earlier, I brought all those objects into the studio to uh, paint from life. I could see that. I could see how you would notice something like that, um, similar in that way where it's almost as if it's a third eye. Uh, you'll notice things that sometimes going through life, a lot of people don't see through the business of life, but you'll see it and you'll have to capture it uh, quickly. Do you, what do you go through more of paint or rolls of film? <laughs> well, I tell you these days I carry a phone around. Now it's just all digital. You don't even need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have a $4,000 camera, which I hardly ever use anymore. Right. Isn't it amazing how that happens? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, and you alluded to it there, Jim, is is just being aware. I think that's the whole deal. And to to bring something that could be momentary into a static state. Uh, and that's what the painting does. You know, the painting never changes. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful feeling. It doesn't happen all the time. And so when it does happen, it feels very special. I can imagine, yes, and you sort of got to capture it, uh, you know, as it's as it's happening. And and I equate that to conversations I've had with uh, singers and musicians who say they'll be inspired by something, then they'll hear a song in their head, and they'll have to run to an instrument and a recorder, press record, and just start playing out whatever that energy force is that's flowing through them of inspiration to get a new song going. Uh, it's a similar thing. Like you're going through life and you'll see the way the, you know, the reflections bouncing off the vehicle into the house, grab the camera, you know, start clipping away and then recreate it. Uh, it's sometimes it's instantaneous, right? It's happening before you and you try to capture it. Absolutely. I know lots of musicians and I hear that, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, this area is very well known for music. For music. Oh, yes. In fact, I must tell you. Muscle Shoals territory. Yeah. My brother-in-law is Jerry Masters, has your name. Really? He is a legendary recording engineer. He's uh, been all around. So he and I have a lot of these conversations about inspiration. Well, tell him he's got to come on the Jim Masters show. It'll be JM and JM, Masters and Masters. But he that is funny. Right now, so you may hear from him. <laughs> that is amazing. Well, it's always, I always say that it's always good to hang around one of the masters. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's funny. Um, 
That's amazing. That really is amazing. Our ours goes back to uh, England and uh, Scotland, Ireland. Uh, the masters came over originally from Yorkshire, England. They settled in New York and spread out from from there. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. Got some more really fantastic. We're we're just scratching the surface of what we have to show our our viewers here. Um, just picked some random things to show. This is wonderful. Well, there you go with the music thing. This is Kimmy Sampson and uh, Dan Lee Murdoch. They're both fa fabulous musicians. And uh, I had uh, sort of pegged them to be in a painting. I, I, I called Kimmy and I said, hey, would you uh, and Dan Lee be willing to be cast as characters in a painting? And she said, oh, yes, of course. And so anyway, um, I, I asked them to meet me down by the river at a particular time on a particular day. And she said, how should we dress? And I said, well, just dress as if you're going to a gig. So we arrived, and Danley is a cello player, and she's a fiddle player. Oh, yeah. And so uh, <laughs> when we got out of our cars, I, uh, I said to them, I said, what did you bring? And she held up this fiddle, which has a lion's head carved on the head of the fiddle. And uh, I said, Danley, what did you bring? He said, a trumpet and a banjo. And I thought, oh, my God. So... Yeah. I said, I have a quilt, an Amish hat, and a chair. Let's figure this thing out. Let's figure this. <laughs> and so we just sort of uh, composed it on the spot. Uh, the light was beautiful. Incredible. I had been on the previous day to see what time the light would be right for that. Um, and uh, my mother made the quilt many years ago. Mm. And so I wrapped the quilt around her shoulders put the hat on her head, put the chair out in the distance and had Danley sit there. And I said, just mm. play. And he started playing. And I asked Kimmy to close her eyes. And the reason yeah. was because it's auditory. Music is auditory. Yes. And I wanted to inject that feeling into the pain. Smart. I love that. You do get that. Absolutely. I also love the fact how you're able to capture the three, I wouldn't say 3D, but sort of just there's a depth to it, just in the shadowing of what looks like sort of pine needles on the ground, those different layers of the, the dark shadows, the shadowing on her face, the distance between the two of them, and then you've got the lake. Then you've got the Rocky Mountain, uh, sort of a ridge there. There is a depth to it. How does how does I don't you want to give away secrets, but how do you capture something like that? How do you create when you're painting that depth like that? Well, Jim, it's all just pictorial principles when you get down. Yeah, there. right. You know. Uh, Color diminishes and blues with distance, and so that gives you that. Those are limestone bluffs across the way. Yeah. Um, and, of course, the relative size of the figures gives you a sense of depth. As of well. the depth. Yeah. But most yeah. of it is just pictorial principles. It's, uh, it's whole yeah. lot. And you can also fully understand what where the sun is coming from, you know, what side of the painting would the sun be on? Obviously, the sun is, you know, I would say coming from the right side, obviously, mm -hmm. reflecting towards the left. You can see that as well. It's uh, just really fantastic when I saw that one. This one, too. Yeah. I have that right in front of me. I can see it uh, in the background here. Wow. This is Donna Hall writing a letter. Um, and, you know, uh, someone was receiving a nice note uh, at some point there. It's, it goes back again to Vermeer and the, and the, the still moments when, and when you can inject thought into the picture. Uh, this is the dining room with the, the mural in the background and the bookcases. And, you know, and, and a little bit of clutter, which is something that I like because I like yeah. a lot of stimuli. Right. It's, it's real. It's, uh, it's warm. It's lived in. Absolutely. 
this is too. Coming from just from about uh, a little over a year ago. Yeah. Uh, during during the first year of COVID, I pretty much locked myself away because. Uh, yeah. it, it, like everybody else, but in, yeah, yeah, it's like. <laughs> In the absence of uh, a social life, I just looked at it as a uh, real opportunity to to do a lot of painting. Um, right. At no limits on time and so forth. And so uh, I was able to do a show at the end of this series, by the way. I did, uh, I was kind of banking on doing about 25 paintings in a year. Yeah. I marked it from March 15th, which was a shelter in place notice to march 15th of 2022 or 2021 and um i ended up with 46 paintings wow which means i had as i say no social life i just painted all the time night and day mm. and i had one little rule of thumb during that period and that was that i can i cannot go out of the house I'm going to compose as many paintings as I can from what I have in the house. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So it was a good, a little bit of a challenge and a, a very enjoyable challenge. Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. There's another fantastic one we're looking at here. On the right, you'll see a little card that has a Vermeer painting in it. Yeah. The, the, the drawing behind the flower vase is uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, his uh, wife. Yeah. And, and then you've got this uh, fella. I don't know where he came from. I bought it at a, in an antique sale. Who is uh, gesturing out to the landscape? And the landscape is actually just something I made up to go out that window. Yeah. I like that. I like the the window has sort of a little bit of an angle to it as well. We showed this one just seconds ago too. That's fantastic. The detail of this. Yeah. Really something. That's, that's a, the, uh, you know, I've used this tapestry, I think about a half a dozen times. For various. Right. You know, I showed this in the introduction too, Tim. Yeah. Well, actually, you mentioned Ronald Rand earlier. Yes. Ronald asked me to do a self-portrait for, he was going to include me in his book, Create. Yes. And he said, would you do a self-portrait for the, for the article? And I said, okay, so this is what I came up with. It's and he incredible. said, you're facing the other way, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Doing yeah. the work, right. Doing the work, yeah, yeah. That is quite amazing. We have uh, again a breadth of fabulous things to uh, to share with our audience. A variety of different things. There's another. This one's fantastic. Yeah, that one's coming up kind of out of focus on my. Yeah, a little bit there. Yeah. yeah. What was that from? Well, that's from the river, and uh, there's a barge coming up the river. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, See, I've got a barge coming up the river as well. Um, you know, when you think about it, as far as like you're talking about landscape, what is it specifically about landscape that speaks to you? Because you do such an incredible job capturing it in the way that you do. Well, every place has its own spirit, you know, its own overriding feeling, I guess you might say. And uh, it's uh, genius loci, you know, every place has its own genius. And I think that uh, I've spent more than 20 years away from here, but this Tennessee River Valley has a feeling that is conducive to creativity. You know, we mentioned the music thing earlier. And there are lots of artists here. There are lots of writers. Um, and I think one of the geniuses of the area is that it is a, it's a springboard to creative thought. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain that, but the pace of life is slow. Uh, it's kind of Mayberry with computers, you might say. Uh, 
people know each other is a very friendly place. Um, but the beauty of the area, the land, which has drawn people for, my goodness, 10,000 years. Um, there's, a, there's a sign down, a marker down by the river that, that uh, draws attention to the fact that this place has been in human habitation for uh, since 8,000 BC. So, um, you know, that, that gives way to, uh, I think, to a spirit of longevity and creativity. Which is wonderful. Again, you know, during the pandemic, that's one of the places people went out to and uh, really, you know, had an opportunity to sort of get re in touch with is, uh, is nature on, on so many different levels. And uh, so we pulled up the website here. This is a fantastic website. We encourage folks to sort of peruse the website to see some of the exquisite work that you do. Um, you know, when you uh, created the website, tell us about some of the things that you were hoping to share with people on this wonderful website. Well, I think there are around 250 paintings on the website. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it hasn't been updated in some time, but, but it serves a purpose. Uh, I'm always creating new things. And, and all, all contact information is uh, available on the website as well. Yeah. And you've really had an opportunity to, um, there, there's some different sections I know in landscape and uh, some of the different things that you have. I want to show, see if we can pull up some of that, like the landscape, you do still life and so much more. Um, let's see, here's one here. Um, now this is, so if you just click on them, it actually brings you to them. Um, this is beautiful. What are we looking at here? Again, the river, there's a, there's a kayaker on the right side of the picture. Uh, and it's late day, you know, there's a luminosity. Um, also like the Danish luminous painters and, and there were some Americans as, as well in the painting. Mm. But I, I end up with you know, another one there's that's similar to that. It has a luminous quality to it. It really does. I like this one too with the birdhouses. Mm -hmm. Just showing people some of the extraordinary work, which you can see on the uh, on the website. This is really cool with the horses. Yeah, it's a small watercolor. Um, it's a very icy morning. I think it has sleeted, and if you saw the painting in person, you could see little fragments of ice on the backs of the horse. Really beautiful. Another one. Somebody out there at the lake. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Here's another. Let's take a look at a couple more here. Toward the river. I like yeah. the way you named them, too. Well, there, you know, there is sometimes, I think the title sometimes will latch on to a narrative aspect. Uh, this painting actually uh, is living in East Tennessee now. I just sold it recently. Did you really? Uh-huh. That, that's a watercolor. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. It really, really is. Um, you know, some of the things that inspire you are um, reflected in this work in such an exquisite way. Here's another, the bridge sunset. Yeah, real small painting. That's uh, probably, I think it's six by nine inches. Mm. Just an effect of a particular moment. The dog sort of walking right. the edge of the lake. That that to me has a dreamlike quality. Doesn't it? it? Well, the, the, the dog's uh, reflection is in the water. and it, It's in very shallow water there, the dog walking along. 
and I cast it uh, in those colors and that sort of uh, feel to give a sense of a dreamlike quality to it. You've captured that. There's another one. Yeah. This would be uh, Sunset. Yeah. 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 Really beautiful. That's a good one there. That's uh, 30 by 40. And that's an oil painting. And um, that was a snow front coming in. Mm. It snowed that night. That's another one. Mm -hmm. Show people the variety coming in. Coming in, the fellow's been out there on the river all day and coming into the slough to bring his boat back. And, uh, yeah. That's beautiful. The depth of the color, the blues too. Yeah, that's a barge coming up the river with the searchlight. Searching. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful, folks. You can see this on the website. Tim Stevenson art.com. It's a beautiful bending. Is that branch bending? Yes, it is. This is yeah. a big turn in the creek. This is about 200 yards from where I'm sitting right now. Is it really? Mm -hmm. It's good as hell. Yeah, that's a favorite place. Uh, the creek that I mentioned just now yeah. enters, the river, enters the river right there at that spot. Hmm. Another real small See, when I, um, when I look at that and I see the way the two trees are merged, it's almost as if they're like a couple and yeah. they're on a high hill and they're well, looking. You know, there are a lot of analogs in nature. We put me Yes. Together. Yes. I see that as a couple and they're together and they've been together for years and they're high on the hill and they're either looking out over at a beautiful valley or looking out at, you know, a, a musical event or something. It just has that, you know, uh, I've got your back. Uh, we're friends. You know, it takes two, that kind of thing. I tend to humanize non-human things, just so you know. <laughs> well, that's great. And, and, I, and I get that with that. Yeah. I mentioned a while ago that uh, a lot of these things will, will kind of give birth to narratives. And, uh, yes. I do the same thing. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Really beautiful work. Look at that. With the chairs. Yeah, two chairs and a, and a French easel. Uh, yeah. I, I painting with a group uh, doing some plain air painting. And uh, everybody got up and went to lunch. And so I thought, well, there's the painting right there. Lunch break, yeah. Cypress Creek. Yeah, that's the creek just, just next to the house. You know, and almost when you look at the tree on the left, it almost looks like, to me, like a head with a beard, nose, and two eyes, <laughs> and, and a hairline, like a George Washington type shaped head. I see a face in that tree. Do you see it? I, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, I see an actual face looking at us. Uh, it's incredible. That's beautiful. You know that if you blinked, you'd think you're in Ireland. Oh, the cliffs of Moher. Yes. Uh, we have several areas in the river here where you have limestone bluffs that go up 150, 200 feet. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. That's wonderful too. Well, point of view here, it's like uh, you know the feeling, Jim, of uh, lying in the grass when you were a kid, and yes, uh, looking up, looking it's up, a very low profile here to give that feeling. The way the clouds are, the specifically the the. Top cloud almost looks like a horse racing, racing to the right. 
There you go again. <laughs> See that a little bit? <laughs> there you go, there you go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's passion. You know, that's it. That's that's it. It's amazing, you know, when you stop. That's the thing. Art. We need to stop in our lives more and look up. I always tell everybody when they're in cities, don't just look down at the cement. Look up, you know, look out. Going over a bridge, look out. This is a terrific one. Well, I have to talk about this fellow, Tom Hendricks. He built a memorial wall, which took him over 30 years to build to his, I think, great, great, great grandmother, mm. who was an Uchi Indian, who was taken captive and taken to Oklahoma in the 1830s. Mm. This 15 year old girl walked all the way back to Alabama. Really? And she was uh, something of a magical person, according to the testimonies I've heard about her. And he decided to build a memorial wall to her. And the last I heard, actually, Tom died about four years ago. But um, the last I heard him say there, he had had over 100,000 visitors to the wall. Really? It's quite a well-known thing in this area. That's yeah. incredible. That, that's absolutely amazing. Wow. That's a, that's a great story. See, there's always a story behind. I did paint his portrait before he died, a couple of years before he died, and uh, did a, a you know a big uh, full-figure portrait of him. This is a small painting here. This is terrific, too. Yeah, that's watercolor. Um, I, after doing uh, a series of uh, still life paintings, I began to get out and and uh, find subjects outside. This was uh, during that period. Uh, hmm. You know, I like this too. Just those two and the lushness of it and the, it's like a Sunday or Saturday afternoon and peaceful and the use of all the green, just life and lush and, you know, we've earned this time together. And the fact, sometimes I, I love when sometimes there isn't a person in it, but there are things that we all use, like chairs. I'm a big chair person. We actually collect chairs. Chairs have a lot of character. And when you look at an empty chair, sometimes you can think of various people. And there you've got the chairs angled towards each other, but also towards the river. And then sort of the picnic basket, you know, things just laid out there, a hat, Maybe they took a walk down by, you know, the the water. Um, they're going on a little nature walk, but then there's their their sweet spot, huh? Yeah, that's so nice. That's very peaceful. That shot. I'd like to paint empty chairs because it serves as an invitation. Here's another one. Yeah. Right, come on in, have yeah. a seat, enjoy, spend some time. Right. Yep. And even the proverbial fold-out chair, same thing, whatever, you know, whether you're going to go with the fancy or you're going to go just whatever you have, a nice fold-out chair, same thing with the, the waterfalls. This is cool, especially the way you got the root system, too, captured that. Yeah, these are cypress trees, and um, this... There's a slough that go, runs parallel to the Tennessee River for about five miles. Mm. And this is up near the headwaters of that. And there are caves into the limestone bluffs that have been excavated by the University of Alabama Archaeology Department for 15 years, I think, they spent here in the summers. And they went back to 8,000 B.C. in those caves. That's incredible. So the feeling there is, I, I get the, it's a palpable feeling of human habitation. Mm hmm Yes, absolutely. I get that too. Late summer. Mm hmm There you go. Yeah, it has that feeling. This one is fantastic too. Swinging Bridge. Yeah, there's a, there's a canyon of, uh, I say it's about 45 or 50 miles from here that has a fantastic uh, structure. It's 
very hard to describe, really. It, it, you feel like you go back in time when you go back into this canyon. And uh, I do feel it, at times being there that I can hardly believe I'm in Alabama. You know, it's, it's like it could be somewhere. In Asia, maybe. Oh, Looks yeah. like that could be in Asia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing, you know, when you when you explore, and that's one of the advantages too, and and then no matter what time of year it is too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rosen Bank. Uh, yeah, Rosen Creek Brook, right? And bank, yeah. 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 Look at the way the ice sort of comes off on the right there. Yeah, the the water is seeping out of the the hillside yeah, into the. Creek. Uh -huh. Blue twilight. Yeah. Those uh, little towhead islands look like macaroons. Don't they? Yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> He's gone from cookies at age three to the macaroons now. It's <laughs> there's a theme running here, folks. It's beautiful. So it's just the sinuous curves there, and yes, uh, that yep. sort of spoke to me, and mm -hmm. the line of that uh, shoreline there. Do you find yourself when you're with folks, um, you're you're stopping and like maybe they're not noticing something? You know, it could be family, friends, people that you're just happy spending the day with or whatever, and you're like, oh wow, look at that, or look at that, or and and uh, you're the one who's doing it. I do it all the time. And and a lot of times people will say they didn't know it until you pointed it out. And then they're like, oh, now I see what you are saying. Does that happen well, to you a lot? I, I do it all the time. I mean, it's, it's, it's a role to play in a way because uh, so much gets by us. I mean, life is so fast. It goes so fast anyway. And then when you're uh, engaged in whatever people get engaged in, making a living or whatever, there's an Amish community not far from here. That's from Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So those folks help me with the uh, lumber for the house I built. It's incredible. Yeah. The clouds and mm -hmm. just capturing as, as life is happening. This is uh, another comforting and you see the person working out in the garden on the right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and notes, a uh, table with a, a book open for these are garden notes. Cup of coffee on the, by the vase. Yeah. Right. Mm. And uh, is that one of the rugs you were talking about? Yeah, that's a Keelum. Uh, it's a flat weave rug. Uh, it uh, was on the back porch. Hmm. This is great. Yeah, I love this. This is, uh, I love the, the feeling of that. It's, Summer break. Yeah, these kids, they, they were promised if they would behave, that they would get a trip to this runoff from a mill. And, uh, and I happened to encounter them. And uh, you can look on the, is it three boys and a girl? The girl's on the left. And on her back is a little turtle. Oh, yeah. Which uh, I took from a cartoon, which was drawn by my friend, Amy Collins. And the turtle has a halo around its head. But I wanted to put the turtle on there to symbolize slowing everything down. Yes, I like that. Yes. Yes. The turtle giving you that sort of vibe. I used to have turtles when I was a kid. <laughs> Yeah, they were terrific. That's beautiful, huh? Yeah, just a pasture at the edge of the trees. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get these phenomenal moments on the last, you know, five minutes. Red sunset. Yeah, and just the desire to put a stamp on it to say, hey, I need to record that. Even something as simple as that, the shape of the branches, the trees, the the uh, color of the house, the uh, 
the green shutters, the curtains, the reflections, the um, silhouette of the trees on the building, as well as just the sort of a little of the dirt with some of the looks like little remnants of snow left and yeah. a bird there in the center. The bird is sitting on a stone and, and the stone has an engraving that says 1815. Yeah, uh, the this, age this, of the house. It was a way station uh, called Pope's Tavern and uh, was used, I think, as a hospital during the Civil War. Hmm. The historic building here in, in town. And that's the front of the building. That's somewhere. the front of it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Weathered. Yeah. This is the Sipsi River. I go back to this spot over and over again in different seasons, and I always see something different. Quite beautiful. Wild wood. Yeah, that's a. Uh, Probably about a hundred yards from where I'm sitting right now. You got a lot of beauty around you there. Oh yeah, holiness, holiness church. Mm. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, we had a an ice storm and and some snow, uh, sort of windy, and the snow was in drifts. And uh, so I got up early in the morning and started walking. The streets were frozen over, and. I walked down to East Florence, which is down in a valley, and was walking along the railroad tracks and encountered this building. And it was a holiness church. Mm. Uh, and it was so pristine and quiet. And I just stood there and looked at it. And I thought, you know, the, the feeling of holiness is right mm. here, in, right now. Mm. Yeah, this is an area out north of town. Uh, I think I call it rabbit hunting. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, just a bunch of fields and and uh, this oak tree that kind of was standing sentinel over the logging road, I think it was, mm. where the snow is curving up to the right. Look at this where he captured the... Uh... It looks like something from, you know, like a thriller movie or something, just the way the branches are. Yeah, there's a bird in the lower right called a hermit. Yes, right, I see it. And I have only seen one of those birds in my life, and I'm, I'm a birder. I look for birds every day. And uh, my wife and I, were we were closing a business in Georgia, and we took some time and went to a nature trail and we got off the trail. We were familiar with the trail. So we got off the trail and we found this old cedar tree and the cedar tree looked to be, I don't know, 150 years old. I don't think I would be exaggerating to say that. And the tops of the limbs were worn down where animals, uh, I was thinking bobcats and, and uh, raccoons and so forth had been using it for roosts. And uh, anyway, we saw this hermit thrush, and I wanted to record that. It's incredible when you just look at all of this. And uh, again, this is just some of his exquisite work that we're kind of just thumbing through here for our enjoyment. Um, this one I love too, Waiting. Yeah, well, there, there's this area has hosts a lot of fishing tournaments and uh, smallmouth bass is what people like to fish for among other things and this was a morning when i was down to watch the launch of a bunch of boats and i think there were 90 90 boats i believe that's correct and uh, so it was kind of fun to watch them when the tournament begins these are high dollar tournaments too by the way jim is, uh, are they really yeah, they give away hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, it, it's really, really fun to watch all these boats go out, these professional fishermen. And, yeah. Wow. How long have they been doing that for? Well, for probably around 25 years. Um, have they really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of a big tourist thing. That's fantastic. 
There's a couple more folks for you to see for your pleasure. This one I love too. Porch yeah. tails. Yeah. I just like the it. detail, you know, just the detail in it. There's a very Americana feel to it. Doesn't it? Yes. It's a great one too. Yeah, the window box. Mm-hmm. Pure, simple, the colors blend. This one's fantastic also. That's a fountain at the university, which is uh, University of North Alabama has about 10,000 students. This is uh, the fountain at the entrance to the main part of the university. Just the way they're capturing the, the falling water. And this one's wonderful too. Green grass. Yeah, so you got horses in the background running free, and then this this horse is all harnessed up and uh, ready to work. Just the detail, I mean, like I say, and, and all of these just... Simple little trickle of water and... Uh, Easy flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way the water is sort of creating its own angular movement mm -hmm. toward Waterloo. Yeah, just looking down, downstream. Hmm. That's this nice. It's a river, in, uh, which is a gorgeous area. It's in Bankhead Forest, named for Tallulah Bankhead's father. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. A little trivia there for you, gang. Wow. Below the falls. Yeah. It's beautiful too. Downstream, winter time. Yeah, this is actually right behind my house. This is the view if you stood on my deck looking downstream uh, toward the Tennessee River, this Cypress Creek. And the curvature in the creek and the curvature in the tree is what yeah, we saw. Yeah, right. It's pulling you in and your eye to uh, the creek. And what is sort of like on the other side? Does it like, yeah, you're, you're wondering what does it, what happens on the other side? Which mm -hmm. The curvature does that. Of course, the windows, and I, I like the way you've got the binoculars there too. Yeah, bird watching, you know. Yeah, morning visitation. That's what we you have, uh, titled this, it. I see uh, osprey, bald eagles, mm. kingfishers, Canada geese. Um, so right out the window, this is the bedroom window. But yeah, first thing I do in the morning is throw the curtains open and see what's out there. Yeah. Every day brings something unique. And that sips the autumn again. Really fantastic things that we're looking at here holy smoke shiloh yeah shiloh battlefield is uh not far from here and uh one of the relics of the civil war mm -hmm. so they were having reenactment the reenactment so i went up in the um, photographs and that's also from there this in this picture, it's small on my screen, but there's a woman in the background. You could see, yes, the image. But I did not know this when I did the painting. I'm going to tell you a fantastic story. I saw a woman dressed in 1860s garb, and I made her picture. In fact, she paused and looked at me, and, and I had the camera in my hand, so I made her picture. And then I did this painting with where a fellow had been, of course it's a mock battle, but a fellow had been wounded and they were calling the ambulance out to pick him up. And I thought about all the mothers and sisters. Mm. You know, there were 23,000 casualties in two days there at Shiloh. It was a very bloody Yes. Battle, a bloody battle. And so I put the woman in there thinking about the mothers and sisters. I learned later that there was a woman who walked out onto the battlefield because she had a son fighting on the Confederate side 
and a son fighting on the Union side. Mm. She actually walked out into the battlefield, maybe saying something like, stop this craziness or whatever. Stop the craziness, right. Yeah. yeah. That's absolutely amazing, huh? Yeah. Jeez, that's maybe. incredible. You know, I want to let folks know, too, in addition to, and we're just scratching the surface of just a few of the things, folks, but there's also uh, an ebook, Chasing Light. Tell us about that. I started making notes uh, around 2004, I believe, or five, uh, And I was really just, you know, I was making notes for my own sake, you know, to kind of get my my next 10 years or so on firm footing as far as my philosophies about art and my thoughts about why to make certain kinds of art. And um, so I began to make these notes and I was going along with that and I had lunch with a friend one day who was a, a, a music entrepreneur. He was a great guy. Um, and I was telling him about the notes and he said, well, I'd like to read some of them if you don't mind. So I, we got back to the studio. I copied off about 10 pages out of my notebook and just handed them to him. And he called me the next morning and he said, every creative person needs to read this. You know, mm. I, I wasn't thinking about other people when I wrote it, Jim, I was just thinking about trying to keep my, my, philosophical and aesthetic thoughts in line with what I really wanted to do for the next 10 or so years. And so eventually I took his advice and I composed those notes into a little book. And um, and it's sold a lot of copies. I've, I've been very proud of what the book has done. It seems to have some legs. Ronald Rand is here. He says, Tim's work is always breathtaking and an honor being able to share his art in my book, Create, seeing his work is soul food. Mm. That's, That's beautifully said by Ronald, huh? Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. Mm. There's the uh, the sight gang um, and also in the studio as well. Tell us about this. I had hung up a, a print of a Rembrandt self-portrait in, in the studio. And this is, it, it was on the door to the main main room, which is all, the door was always opening back, you know, against the wall. And I had tacked up and taped up little mementos all around this print. And so I walked in there one morning and the morning light was reflecting on the glass uh, of the print and it just hit me you know that that here is is a something that's going back and forth in time right in front of my eyes mm. and so i started uh, trying to figure out how to make that into a painting it really is incredible, uh, Tim, on so many different levels, all these different things that we're looking at here, um, which I think is fantastic. And then tell us about this, this kind of printing as well. The clay printing started about, uh, oh, really 25 or so years ago. Um, it's, it's in essence, it's inkjet printing, but it's just on a very high level. And yeah. the inks are permanent. They've been tested uh, to last something like 200 years, uh, very permanent. Mm. Form. Form There's of, uh, still life too. Two apples. Yeah. These are beautiful. Yeah. The depth yeah. of the color. Yeah. I had a friend uh, that was importing French wine at the time. And so I did a series of paintings incorporating his wines. Love that with the corks. Yeah. Herringbone pattern. Evenings. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. 
Look at this, folks, huh? Isn't it fantastic? Fire red pears. Hmm. Afternoon stream. Crab apples. Birds and feathers. You you like with these, you probably enjoy um creating the setting as well, right? Sort of setting it. Oh, absolutely. Yes, the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh you know, this was during that period I mentioned much earlier about uh, 80 paintings in 10 years. Um and as I went along with it, the, the, the compositions got a little more complex. But they all involve boreal rugs in one form or another. Worlds. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Again, we're just scratching the surface, folks. You can definitely take a look. Um, 88 degrees. Mm. Eggplant afternoon. These are just some of the still life. Rembrandt with figs. Yeah, so from time to time, I like to honor some of the artists who have been inspiration to me. And this is Rembrandt's portrait of his second wife. Fantastic. Spider Lily. Mm -hmm. mm, these are all terrific. And again, these are just some of the still life, everybody. Um, here's some other figurative like we were talking about. Copycat. <laughs> you must love creating the titles too. You'd be great for, uh, as a headline guy at a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> that is yeah, funny enjoy that part of it it's uh, right it's great fun you're right exactly yeah cooling this, off well this was a study you know the painting of the four kids sitting out in the, in the yes mm -hmm. i did a small study of this girl coming up out of the water i thought she might be in the background somewhere but she didn't make it to that painting yeah yeah This is my wife, Carol. She, uh, we, we were at a, at a weekend house. This is back in Georgia. And, um, and uh, they had collected uh, European antiques and so forth. Mm. So it looked like a great setting for a painting. I did actually several paintings there. Alabama fishing. You know, I noticed that this fellow has his hat on backwards. Oh, looked, yeah. Yeah, look at the crown. Right, right. There's, there's a funny story about him. He, <laughs> there was a little kid that was impatient, and he, he, would, he just couldn't keep his pole in the water, you know. So every time this fellow would catch a fish, the kid would say, Mr., give me that fish. Mr., give me that fish. And when he turned around, he was getting annoyed finally, and he turned, and I took his picture. You know, it, <laughs> you could see the frown of his brow and uh, the mouth and the eyes. Like <laughs> American Beauty. Yeah. This is one of my young students back a few years ago. Mm. Done several museum paintings. Uh, the feeling of being in a museum, it has a sort of church-like quality. Yes. Did Absolutely. Yeah. Sculpture, Greek sculpture, and a few. Yeah, these are young people looking at Bacchus, uh, the painting of Bacchus by Caravaggio. It's amazing, you know, how what we're looking at are paintings yeah, and not look, looking at a photograph. I mean, or film, it's, it's amazing. Just the work. I was sort of envious of these kids. They were, this is in um, the Tate in London. Oh and yeah. Little kids were, were seeing their 
countryman, John Constable, and getting the teacher was giving them a little lecture on Constable. And, Incredible. Yeah. So it's fantastic. Just really, you know, when you see all this, just here's some more mm, rock springs. Mm -hmm. This one's great. Yeah, all the different colors and Sunday afternoon, and just the way they're lined up and just the angle of everything. And the colors I used made me think of sherbet ice cream. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a food connection here with all these things, folks. <laughs> Wine and cheese and bread and cookies and sherbet and sign us up. <laughs> yeah. Food for the soul through beautiful artwork like this that does have that feeling. This is great, the way you've captured that. The old street in Amsterdam. Amsterdam, yes. Been there many times, and it's it's beautiful. Yeah. Great cities in the world. Incredible. That's Amsterdam as well. I think my niece has that painting now. That's wonderful. Winter walk. Yeah. The uh, and, and again, this is a big watercolor. It's a, I think it's around 40 inches wide. And what I loved about doing this, other than painting my wife once again, but uh, is the transparency of the water up near. Mm -hmm. Visitation. Yeah. Mm, the movie theater, Marquis. Yeah, yeah, our old theater here in town, which is not a movie theater now. It's a performance center. You know, that's what a lot of them have become as a result of, you know, just everything that's gone on. Um, and then like this. Yeah, now, yeah. these are paintings. I mean. These are all fish that are, are in the waters around where I live here. Is this amazing, everybody watching? Don't you feel like you're just looking at like an actual photograph? Uh, the fact that these are paintings is incredible. God. Mm. Yeah, I like I like, I like to fish. I, I don't fish as much as I used to. But a lot of interesting ones around you, too. There are, these are all sunfish. So yeah. Lots and lots of sunfish around. Crappie. Yeah. Flight yeah. thoughts. Yeah, there's a, on the bottom is a diagram that came out of Da Vinci's notebooks that had to do with flight. And mm -hmm. Everything in it, the maple seeds, you know, was flight oriented and the turkey feather at the top and a little string to kind of do loop-de-loop. -loop. Mm. And then, you know, some of this, Jim, is just to, to take a pause and look at things, you know? I do that too. And the shapes yeah. of things and... Yeah. yeah. The nests, yeah. A nest that has already done its work um which is beautiful the seashells mm. piece of uh turtle shell yeah the fragments i paint lots of feathers i have a collection of probably 300 feathers it's incredible those are loon feathers that's common loon feathers mm. Just the shapes. There's a woodpecker feather and a seed pod and a leaf. And, you know, when I do my afternoon walks, if it's, you know, if, well, I walk in the mornings in the summer, but I just pick up things and bring them in and bring them to the studio. And then a pause between major paintings would be just to sit down and do something like that. How often do you do those walks, Tim? How often are you, you know, out there doing your thing and capturing it. I mean, are you inspired 24 seven? I mean, I, my eyes operate like a camera 
And I'm always, everything that I see has an angle, a shadow, a silhouette, a, uh, a color. And, you know, I see it all and it, it inspires me uh, on many, many different levels. Well, 40% of our brain is devoted to eyesight. So that gives you the importance of it right there. And yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm out there uh, five times a week. You know, weather will get in the way sometimes, but uh, I like to take some time and hit the nature trails or go walk by the river and, and just see what I'm going to see that day. Every day's a new day. So, yeah. It's, you know, Ronald said, um, tell us about how you left the abstract period. I had a brief abstract period. I, I went to uh, from abstraction to uh, a form of surrealism for a number of years, for about five years. Uh, I, I think I, I was just slowly making my way to realism. Uh, all my drawing training was realistic in nature. And, but, but abstraction had an appeal for me. It, it just, it wasn't the language that I needed to say the things I wanted to say. Because I do have, being a Southerner and coming from a family of storytellers, I very often will attach some narrative aspect to what I do. Uh, if it's not a narrative in itself, it will evoke narration of others quite often. And uh, so uh, I enjoyed abstract painting uh, and, uh, you know, it was fun. I, I enjoyed uh, studying color theory and thinking about what, uh, what can happen when you eliminate subjects, quote unquote. I love exactly. Mark by the way, you know, there uh, are Gerhard Richter, mm. uh, contemporary painter. I just yeah. uh, but for me, I, I think it dawned on me probably in my late twenties around, yeah, about late twenties that I wanted to, I wanted to teach myself how to paint realistically and representationally because there were stories that I wanted to tell. And, uh, and I wanted to evoke that in others. Tell us about, people have been commenting about all that's surrounding you, all that if you were a guitarist, you'd have all the guitars around you. In this case, you have all the beautiful works there. Tell us about the room you're in and some of the things we're seeing all around you. Well, the room is, it's a big room. It's upstairs. I have eight windows. Uh, which will be in that direction. <laughs> Everything's in reverse here. Um, and I have a loft that has probably 200 paintings in it. Um, and, and, you know, I like to look at paintings when I complete them for a number of days to, to see how, what effect they're having on me. And so, uh, yeah, it's a great place to work. You know, I, I've come come up the stairs about eight o'clock in the morning and take a lunch break somewhere along the way and uh, come back up and work to 3.34 in the afternoon. You have a beautiful one that's to the right of you and then you have a beautiful one that is to the left of you. Tell us about those. Let's see. This one with the, it's a, a fallow field there are, there are farms uh, just two to three miles from me. Um, and in the winter, when things are at rest, uh, I think it's very appealing um, to see things resting and getting ready for the next year. So that painting is, uh, like I say, it's just a short distance from me. This is a Tennessee River painting. Uh, looking downstream and the thing that was interesting to me about that was the structure of those clouds and the, the sense of movement that they have in them. There's another one. It's beautiful. Go back a little farther into the corner there. There's another river scene. 
and behind is another. Is it okay if I move this and show you? Oh, so yeah, we've had people take us through their entire house. I mean, absolutely. Whatever you like to do, we're here. Well, the way the light is, let me uh, let me flip another overhead light on, and we'll try to do that. Are we having fun, JMS Lovities? Isn't this amazing? Yes. Look at this. Beautiful. So there's, there's the windows. This is my workspace over here. Uh, and we'll go around and see. There's a big oil painting of Frozen Creek. We had that up on the screen a while ago. And the snowy field. The, and... Donna Hall writing a note, and then I'll spin on around. Let's see here. There's the loft with paintings upstairs and a few other things. And back around. Seems like a nice, peaceful place to be, Tim. That That's beautiful. Tell us about that one. This, uh, let's see if I can get it centered up a little better. That is a, a place that I've frequented quite a few times. And there's a trail that leads down to that point. And people will jump off of there and into the water. It's about 70 feet tall. So, yeah, I just love the patterns in the water. It's incredible. Are you a swimmer? <laughs> well, I tell you what I like to do is I uh, <clears throat> I like to get in the creek and wade mm. and I like to fly fish. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great place for that. Get it centered up here. So yeah, I can uh, literally walk out my door, walk down to a neighbor's house and walk down into the creek and take a fly rod and walk up and down the creek and fish. Are there places not only across the United States or maybe even into Canada, but around the world that fascinate you to the point where you would love at some point, if you have the opportunity to travel there, to capture that, not through, you know, things people send you, but from what your eyes actually see and maybe the photographs you take and what it is that you're experiencing. Are there other places across the United States and or around the world that are still on Tim's to-do list? Well, I made quite a few trips. Well, not quite a few, about five trips to Maine. And I've painted in Maine uh, around Manchester and out on Monhegan Island. Um, fantastic uh, from from a visual person's point of view. Maine's a Maine. beautiful state, isn't it? Yeah. So the coast of Maine, uh, I like the culture there. Um, Cascow Bay and yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, around. Have you been to Monhegan by any chance? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, you know, I mean, that's a splendid place and and i've done a number of paintings from there i don't usually show them because they're out of my category in a way mm -hmm. but i've probably done i don't know 30 or 40 paintings from mm. yeah that's incredible how do you like to describe your work your category your your vibe your feeling your genre if that can be categorized well I think that I have, I, I sort of look for poetic aspects to what I'm, what I'm looking at, you know, what I see. Um, I don't know if, you know, that, that word probably covers a lot of territory, but, um, you know, I'm in the general category of representational art. Mm -hmm. And, but I have a, a strong sense of place, you know, so maybe that's the, the most fundamental aspect of what I do. And, and the overriding thing to all of that is beauty. You know, just yeah. 
if you have beauty and poetry and a sense of place, uh, there are a lot of possibilities. What are some other things that you haven't tackled yet, too, that you still would like to tackle in these decades and decades of incredible creativity for you, Tim? Man, I don't know. Uh, I have been experimenting in the last year with uh, doing some very different things that are not in my wheelhouse. Um, in fact, I'm working on a painting right now that is the interior of a restaurant. Uh, I think it's the first time I've ever done that, actually. And uh, it's it's a waffle house. Do you have, you know, like IHOP and that sort of thing? Whenever we drive from the Northeast to Florida, we stop at the waffle houses. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I love their home fries. <laughs> yeah. So I'm working on a painting that is of a scene from the corner of a Waffle House, like there are three people at this table, one fellow at this other table, totally different from anything else. And I may just put it in a sleeve and, and leave it for a while and see if it has any resonance for me later on. But I don't know, I experiment, I'm always experimenting. But as far as developing a whole series, the only thing that I haven't done to any great depth is figurative art. Hmm. did a lot of it in college you know uh, we had live models you know for four or five years and, and did a lot of that uh, those were mostly studies uh, yeah so you know maybe i'll go back to that i don't know you know it's amazing uh, i would imagine too when you get the feedback from people who purchase it and then they have it on their walls in their homes or it's in museums and uh, exhibitions and galleries and things of that nature. Uh, and you get the feedback, people contact you and let you know how much that means to them and what that, the things that they see with their eyes and the things they feel, uh, maybe it triggers wonderful memories of their childhood or, or wonderful moments in their life through what you've seen and captured. That must be truly the, uh, the icing on the cake to all of this, huh? I wrote a note to someone once. Uh, they bought a painting and, and I, this thought stayed with me now for many years. I said to her, making art is like speaking into a darkened room, hoping someone will answer. And when someone takes a painting home, that's an answer, you know? So I think that's that's kind of the thing is making the connections and uh, doing something that will mean something to someone else. Um, it, it's a big deal. Why do you love doing this so much, my friend? It's obviously you're dedicated to it and it goes back many years and uh, not always easy. Make it look easy. Make it look effortless. There's a lot of investment uh, financial and emotional and physical in it why does it continue to bring you such great blessing and joy i think it's something i have to do jim i, I don't think it's optional uh, when i'm immersed in this i mean obviously i like having a social life I like having friends and and uh, i mean we have parties here at the house i'm about to have a couple of musicians come in and very nice going to have a, a big to do here in, in a couple of weeks. Is it for a special event or just to have people come by? It's just, it's just for the fun of it. Yeah. But the thing that I love most and I think that I have to do is make art. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, well, to extend that thought just a little bit. Yeah. And I look around in, in today's world things, you know, we have a lot of turmoil in the United States politically, and, you know, uh, mass shootings, uh, you know, a lot of troubling things. And I would like to think that art in all its forms can offer an antidote to, to all of that. You know? So I feel compelled 
I feel compelled to continue. You know, I think I have like somewhere around 7,000 paintings under my belt at this point. Do you really? Wow. Yeah. This, for, this is my 51st year as a professional. So, Congratulations. I just keep doing it, you know, keep doing it. Keep, you know, keep the hope alive that, that there is some goodness that comes out of all this. And uh, that to, you know, the, that word hope, you know, that yeah. the hope be better, that we can do better. I mean, you know, I can be adamant about that sometimes just to think that we could be better people. We could live better lives. Yes. Have greater effect on those around us. It's just very, very important that we do that. It really is. And your longevity in doing it is a testament to the passion and the skill and the creativity and the eye and the feeling that you have for what you do. Um, it's really beautiful work, exemplary work, and I was so honored and pleased to have an opportunity because I think in similar ways, kindred spirits on many levels, uh, and see some of the things that you see in just everyday life. You don't let life pass you by. You feel it and you capture it and you vividly see it and, f and you feel it to your depth that you have to express it. I think a lot of people that do art and creativity um, and express that they really do um, feel things to their depth, to their core. And, and you do, don't you, Tim? Oh, did you lose your audio? You, you, you lost your sound? <laughs> what a great question for me, for you to lose the sound on, huh? That was a fantastic question. Um, you want to come out and go back in again? You know, like you did that time when we were testing, uh, there's a lot of storms that are happening down south. So um, like you did last time, yeah. He's going to disappear for a second. Big finger. He's going to press a button <clears throat> and watch him. You get to see a little behind the scenes of the making of all of this. Boom. There is. He'll be back. Uh, there's some some tough storms happening in the southern part of the United States right now. If you, you watch the Weather Channel, you watch the news, you see some of that. We send our thoughts to everybody down in the south. Uh, he's going to come back for a uh, comment. Ronald uh, says, Tim is also a marvelous poet and has written marvelous stories. Some are unforgettable. I know, and I don't doubt. Here he comes back. He's a trooper. Welcome back. <laughs> so the sound went out on you. It is just kaput. Well, you can see us, which is good. So I will show you that George Burns is here. <laughs> and George Burns said he had a phenomenal time. He thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. He thoroughly enjoyed what we were talking about. And he said, you are truly an artiste. And when you watch this back, you'll be able to see everything that we're saying and we're showing. You can see on the screen here. Thank you, Tim, for coming on to the show tonight. You're an amazing artist. Your paintings are mind blowing. Please come back to us soon. And as I mentioned earlier, Ronald says, Tim is also a marvelous poet. He's written marvelous stories. Some are unforgettable. Jane in Sweden says, amazing. Jen Berry in Pennsylvania says, such a fun show tonight. This was really fantastic, Tim. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate all of your time. You're a master of your craft. And um, enjoy watching this episode in the archives. And we thank you so very much for, uh, for being with us, my friend, okay? You take care and be well. <laughs> Tim Stevenson joining us. Thanks, Tim. He uh, his audio sort of died out there at the end. Here is the uh, the website gangtimstevensonart.com. and he's truly a master of his craft. You got a chance to see just a sprinkling of fifty one years of making magic through his art. Um, truly class act on many levels and truly uh, 
we were testing the audio and everything before we went on because he was having some technical difficulties. Uh, there are some crazy things. He said something about a router too. He had a router problem this morning and uh, his router went out and then it went on and his router went out again, which supplies the Wi-Fi. So he may be having a little trig uh, you know, trickle of a problem with his Wi-Fi kicking out his audio. But 99.99% .99 of it is there for your pleasure while you watched live or you're going to watch this again in the uh, archives. There again is timstevensonart.com. Truly a uh, craftsman in so many ways, so many ways. Maureen in uh, Arizona says, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful art with us. You're amazing. Please come back again. And Jen Barry says, Tim, thank you for spending time with us. And thank you for inspiring me to draw, sketch, and paint again. You are an incredible person, an artist. Come back soon, Tim. And of course, Ronald Rand, a big supporter and fan of our show. We thank Ronald as well, and also for being with us too. Um, he loves our show, and he's been so gracious, a big supporter of our show. Gang, if you would like to support all of these epi episodes, the hundreds and hundreds of episodes that we keep cranking out for all of you. Give this episode a like, thumbs up like, leave a comment uh, in the comment section on your YouTube channel, our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. And uh, subscribe, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV as well. And uh, you'll be glad when you do that because you'll be uh, a part of the JMS Lovety family. And we really appreciate you doing that. But also if you click the notification bell, you will be able to get uh, notifications from us direct that are just basically saying, hey, this episode's coming up. This guest is coming up. So uh, drop a comment in the comment section. Give us a like. Leave a uh, comment for us and hit that red subscribe button or the black subscribe button. Some people, it's a black subscribe button. Uh, it depends on where you happen to be. We thank Tim for being with us. He is absolutely amazing. Truly amazing, and uh, one of America's finest landscape painters, and of course, more than just landscape, but uh, known for so much of it. And Jen says, uh, Jim, thanks for bringing all of us together again. The pleasure is all mine. Again, we thank Tim for being here. We thank you for being with us here on the Jim Masters Show live series. Always a pleasure to have you guys here. Spread the word. Want to let you know about some other great guests coming up. Tomorrow, we have the renowned Terry J joining us. She's a cowgirl shaman, an intuitive psychic medium, also an animal communicator. And she's going to be joining us tomorrow right here on the show. And then starring along with Jeremy Renner in mayor of Kingstown on uh, Paramount Plus, also in Showtime's Three Women, and also the brand new, actually debuting in just a couple of days on Peacock, is Poker Face, Marcus L. Brandon, actor, going to be with us here on the show. He's incredible. He's actually here. We just booked him today, <laughs> actually late last night. Uh, we were approached uh, to have him come on the show. And I said, absolutely. And he's in all these hot series that are on right now, these series. And um, Marcus is going to be with us Thursday, this coming Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And then Tim Chismar is going to be with us. Best-selling author, award-winning speaker, headlining comedian and actor. He is going to be with us. Tim on Friday, and that's going to be great. These are all fantastic people who are well known in their respective worlds, and they're all going to be with us this week, tomorrow, Wednesday, and then Thursday. Join us live as brilliant actor Marcus L. Brandon's with us. Um, he's amazing, he's in, starring in so many top shows right now, he's in high demand. So we're very excited to be able to squeeze some time out with them here on the Jim Masters Show series. That's Thursday. And then Friday, best-selling author, award-winning speaker. He's also a publisher, uh, comic book creator, headlining comedian in Vegas and everywhere else. He's worked with Jeff Foxworthy. He's worked with everybody and a great actor as well. 
And he always has a wonderful message uh, as a terrific author and speaker. He's with us on Friday right here on the Gym Masters Show. So lots of great episodes and guests and so much more coming up every single day. Around here, we don't say goodbye. We say see you later. Ciao, cheers. Hasta la vista. Buenas noches. Uh, be well. Slancha, muy lu. Cheerio. Take care and be well for all of us here at the Gym Masters Show. Thank you so very much for taking time to uh, stop by our series. We're working really hard behind the scenes, not just to throw up a show, you know, slap it together, but to really give you something of value. Some levity, some laughs, some entertainment, some inspiration, some information, and bringing us all together in an interactive way uh, from around the world. And uh, really fantastic. And uh, let's see, check in with a few more. Sherry Larson in Kansas, USA says, Thank you, Jim, for another fantastic show. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, that's the icing on our cake. And uh, this was wonderful, amazing paintings. Uh, good night, all. Sweet dreams, all. Thank you very much, Sherry, for that comment. Appreciate that. If this was your first time watching, welcome to the Gym Masters Show. Join us again. We're here every day, just about. And uh, if you'd like to support what we do when the shows are on, you can do super chat, super emoji, super stickers. That's something that is available in the chat room. And anytime, 24-7, even when the show isn't on, and maybe you're binge watching, there's a little heart icon under every episode that says super thanks. If you click on that, that helps support everything we're doing here. The hours and hours and hours of content and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guests who've come through Lovity Hall and the Gym Master Show live series. And uh, Maureen, thank you very much. So great to have you here. Tight hugs to you as well. And to, to Jane in Sweden, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And all the newbies and folks uh, returning. And thank you, Jane. And thank you, Amy. Good to see you, Amy, as well. What a wonderful show, she says. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And stop back often and enjoy more from our series. We're here to uh, lighten the load for everybody. Ronald Wren, of course, The Incomparable, says, A marvelous show, Jim. You're a great host. Thanks for the great interview. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you very much, Ronald, for being here. And again, for your love and support of the Gym Master Show series, the unique show, the unique series, the unique format, and what we're doing, which is quite special. And we really appreciate it. You guys will make it special as well. Those commenting and those who quietly watch, uh, just drop a comment in our comment section. We'd really appreciate that. If you've never left a comment in the comment section on our YouTube channel, very easy to do before you go away. Just give us a like and leave a comment. We would really appreciate that. Do you know when you do that, it actually helps more people see when you click like on our episodes, when you subscribe to our YouTube channel and when you drop a comment in the comment section, that actually, and thank you very much, Jen, Bundle up there in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, when you do take the time to give us a thumbs up, leave a comment in the comment section on underneath the episode and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That allows more people to see the episodes because the way their algorithm works at YouTube is the more interaction uh, with those likes and comments and all of that, they push the episode out further around the world. So more new levities can see what you're enjoying. So that's why. We really appreciate it. Those who do thumbs up, like on the episodes, leave a comment underneath and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have, thank you very much. We appreciate that to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. All right, we're going to scoot out. Uh, love having all of you here. It's always one big party here at uh, Lovely Hall and on JMS. Again, a lot of great guests coming up and uh, we appreciate your time and uh, all of your love and support and and thanks for being with us. We'll see you on all the social media. You can find me at Gym Masters TV on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Gym Masters TV. And of course, our YouTube channel is Gym Masters TV. We love you all. Take care and be well. And we'll see you again on the next episode of the Gym Masters Show series. Hope you enjoyed this one. Let us know. Leave a comment. We appreciate it. Take care and be well. Cheers. <laughs>